my name is John Megling. I'm uh, one of the system engineers on the Azure team. And uh, today uh, we're just going to take a, what was requested is to take a basic look at the Azure calculator. Uh, specifically, I'll be working through an example uh, that I put together that we use for training uh, for some of our internal uh, cloud specialists, things like that. Uh, so hope you found that you know helpful. And we'll take a look at Azure backup pricing, and then a quick look at Azure site recovery. The thing to remember is again, this is kind of a a one on one kind of thing as far as the calculator goes. Uh, if you've used the calculator a lot, um, there may be some stuff you know that we'll go over uh, that will help you out. Uh, if not, um, if you haven't priced or used the calculator much at all, then I think you'll find this um, pretty helpful. So with that, I'll get into what we're going to take a look at. So um, <clears throat> again, this is an example I use um, internally here for uh, training that I put together. Uh, on the left is uh, the on-premise side, and on the right is uh, an Azure hybrid cloud solution. Uh, so you can do hybrid, or you don't have to do hybrid if you want to move all. We can kind of discuss that as we go along. And um, then the chart down here is, um, again, BitTitan product is great. Um, you know, majority of our customers use that product to get that uh, type of analysis, and it gets really in depth. Um, but we do have a, a lot of smaller customers that, that you know somewhat do the analysis themselves using um, you know, things that are built into Microsoft or the Microsoft Assessment Planning Tool. So I've just got this chart down here to give us an example of, of you know this solution that's above it, so that we can uh, take a look and make some choices when we step into the calculator. So when you look at this, we've got the um, the web server. Uh, we've got some workstations uh, which we're going to keep on site. We've got two domain controllers. We've got a SQL server, <clears throat> which feeds that web server. And in this case, um, we've got some remote users that uh, VPN into this firewall and get onto the, uh, the network. So when we look at what we're wanting to recreate this in Azure, uh, we, again, we've got our domain controller tier, our SQL tier. Uh, in this case, it shows an availability group. For this example, we're going to focus on one SQL server, not the availability group. And um, then we're going to do one or maybe two web servers. Again, want to keep it as close to possible so you can kind of see how to go through that. Uh, it's easy to make changes or add things or take things off, as you're going to see. Uh, we've got the Azure network. We've got our VPN site-to-site uh, -site gateway. And then we've got a point-to-site -site gateway. The same firewall is represented here that was over here. And then we still have our network. In this case, uh, they're keeping a domain controller on site. Again, you don't have to do that, but uh, that does come up quite a bit. With our customers, so again, that's why we um, we show it. So I'm going to be swapping back and forth between this and the calculator. So let me go ahead and pull up the calculator. So hopefully you've been to the calculator. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, you can find it very easily. Uh, pick the search engine of your choice and just type in um, Azure Calculator or Azure Pricing. Um, or if you just go to azure.microsoft.com, there's a pricing. You can see there's different um, top-level categories and pricing is the category that we're specifically in right now. And um, if you have questions too, um, you know, again, you can ask in this call, or if not, you want to set up a, uh, you know, a session with myself or, or someone on our team. Uh, that's very easy to do. I, I'll have my contact information at the end. If there's a specific uh, situation you're working on and you've been, uh, you know. Do you have questions or you've been struggling maybe to figure out the pricing for what it would look like, let me know. And then um, we can go through it, you know, the technical and, and work through the calculator. And if there's specific things about the calculator that, again, you want to really drill down on and talk about, um, again, contact me and we can um, we can kind of go through that uh, one on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Then the, um, so the first thing we're going to do, so when we look at our, uh, we're going to focus on our compute workload. Again, a lot of people like to use the calculator in different ways. I have my way of doing it. Um, there's no you know, specific way that you have to do it one way or the other. I like to do the virtual machines, uh, then do the storage, and then I like to, um, you know, to do the extra items that I need after that. So that's kind of how I'm going to go through it today. So when we look at it, we hit virtual machines out of our compute workload. We go down to the estimate, and this is the only thing, you know, mine was clear. So that's the other thing to remember. When you're starting new estimates or you just go and modify what you have, you want to clear it, you just clear it over here. So in my case, the first thing we want to do in all cases is pick the uh, data center that's nearest us. Um, as you can see there, there's lots of choices. Um, let me go ahead and make that drop down come up again. Uh, I'm in the East U.S., specifically Florida. 
Uh, there's two East USs, East US and East US2. And you will find um, that between data centers, sometimes there are things that um, are in some data centers and aren't others. So that's rare. So if you run into that, you may have to, like, if I find out that uh, something I'm trying to do is not offered in the East US data center, but it's offered in the US, uh, East US2 data center, I might, I would want to switch that. But anyways, for this example, we're going to go East US. And this is nice. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, name our machine so that way we can keep track of it. So in this case, we're going to just call this domain controllers. And if you remember, we had two of them. Um, I don't have to create two. Uh, I can keep the one on hybrid, but we'll create two in this example. So we get the ECS data center. In this case, uh, you can see the different workloads that are available. Um, when it comes to workloads, uh, our Windows domain controller is going to be Windows based. So we're going to pick Windows. If we picked Windows with SQL Server, which we're going to do a little bit later, for our database, it's going to include the SQL Server as part of that. And the thing to remember is what we pick includes the licensing for it when it comes to the Microsoft product. So when I pick Windows, I'm going to get the uh, Windows Server license included in the charge that we pick here, and I'm also going to get the uh, client licenses included. Now, manage this is a relatively new concept from Microsoft. The um, managed disk is is um, a new way of handling disk. There's no storage um, uh, accounts for uh, managed disk. They have their own resource groups. And in the larger situations, that's nice because it uh, removes some limits that were there. Microsoft had recommended typically about 40 um, disks in a storage account. So a lot of our larger customers and our medium and larger customers found they were having to create a lot of a lot of um, a lot of storage accounts to manage disk. So in this case, it becomes a resource, and uh, there's some really neat things you can do to it. With I'm going to be uh, publishing an actual uh, video, which uh, you know I, I do on YouTube, that uh, kind of talks to manage this and some of those other cool things related to snapshotting and backup and things like that. But in this case, because still most of our customers aren't doing that, I'm not going to pick that for these two domain controllers. Uh, the pricing tier, standard or basic, uh, basics typically for development, uh, you know, things you're testing in Azure. So we're going to stick to the standard tier. And always in Azure, too, in the calculator, you can see if you hover over the uh, information, a lot of times it will give you informa or information related to what's going on in that category, especially if you're new. Um, I use this sometimes, too, and stuff pops in that I haven't seen before. Um, the um, So then the other thing we have to get into is, um, I guess we'll talk about this real quick, uh, the, uh, the actual um, uh, use rights that you can get. When you buy a Windows Server, if you buy it with Software Assurance, you do get some use rights to use it in Azure, specifically data center lets you use it on site and in Azure, and you get some capacity there. So that's in that's where they're talking about you may be able to bring your license with you. It's a software assurance benefit. So if you have questions about that, again, I'll have our uh, slide at the end that has our sales team on it, and uh, or you can contact me and we can talk about what those uh, those usage benefits may be for your customers. So the next thing we're going to do is um, the size of the machine. Uh, you can see it starts at the A series and gets into the D series. And then there's version twos of different things. So A is, uh, Ds are always a little faster than As. So sometimes if it uh, costs the same, you want to go in the D series. I tend to build most things in the D series. There's nothing wrong with the A series, though. A lot of you know our customers use those, and we do recommend the A series also. Um, the uh, thing to remember, I'm going to show you this about VM sizes. So, uh, and again, if you want it, I've got a document that uh, outlines these, these links that has this information. If that's something you're interested in receiving, uh, you can email me, and I'll have my email address at the end, uh, and I can get the, that uh, document with all those links to you. But you can see general purpose workloads, which is what we're working with today, uh, the D series, A series, um, the FF series, lots of different series of virtual machines. And uh, even if we're doing some high-end video, we get down into some of these um, these heavy graphic, you know, uh, VMs that are in V and NC series. But the 98% of what we do is in the D and the A series, and you can click into that, and it'll give you another rundown of what these um, these series of machines look like and things like that. So there's a lot of information out there, which is a good thing. So I'm going to switch back over to the calculator. So actually, I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint. So when we look, our domain controllers, one, they're both one CPU, one's 8 gig, one's 14 gig. Um, and you can see the utilization. Again, this would be an overall utilization. It's not specific to memory or CPU. 
uh, CPU or anything like that. Just overall utilization of the machine for this example, so we can kind of go through it. We can see the first one is not heavily utilized. Um, uh, the second one is also our file server, so it's more utilized and requires a little more storage. So we'll just focus on this first one to start with. Um, and we look at it, again, it's, it's one CPU and eight gig of RAM, and it's only 10% utilized. So uh, when we come over here and we look at our series of machines, uh, one core, we can go two cores, seven gig of RAM, that more matches what we have now, but it's underutilized. So in this case, the D1 might work really well for us. And in my case, uh, you know, just with experience, I would say that's gonna cut it for that machine. So when I pick that machine, it gives us the, uh, the rate, and we can see number of virtual machine, seven, 744 hours, which means it's on all the time, um, every, every day, and that's typically what we're gonna run. Now, you can actually set up rules to shut them down, and you can adjust those hours, but for this example, we're gonna go with an always on, all the time uh, situation, and um, we're gonna go with that. I'm actually gonna change the name. We're gonna change this to main controller number one. So that's what we're going to do for number one. You can see um, it's basically $104.16 a month. Um, we will need to add a little storage to that, but that's going to give us our compute uh, cost, and we'll cover storage in a second. And we can see on the right here, it'll start doing a roll-up of our cost, and we'll talk about that in a second, but we can export that out as an actual estimate for the customer. Um, so we've got our domain controller in there. Um, then we're going to go ahead and add our second domain controller, so we're going to hit virtual machines again. We're going to go back down to our estimate, and we want to change that to the East US piece. And it's going to be a Windows-based workload. We're not going to use managed disk for this example. We're going to work in the standard um, realm like we talked before. And then when we look at the workload on this one, one CPU, 14 gig of RAM, and it's 30% utilized. So I want something a little bigger than this D1. So in this case, I'm going to pick the D2. And we can see our price goes up, but we're going to get more horsepower for that um, to make controller slash file server. We go up here and we'll name it. Again, you can put whatever you want to in here. And you can see it changes the name and gives us the update over there, right? So now we've got our two domain controllers in our example, which we've covered this. The next thing we want to look at is our uh, web server and look at that workload. Um, we can see it's two CPUs, 32 gig of RAM, and it's 25% utilized. So we're going to add, again, our, uh, sorry about the redundancy in this, but I think it's a pretty good example of kind of what to do here. Um, we'll go ahead and add that virtual machine. We're going to change that name. So we know we have a description for it as it builds it over there. For East US, where it's a Windows based um, web server. Again, we're in the standard tier. And it had two CPUs and 14 gig of RAM. Um, in this case, I could go over, um, you know, and, and um, well, not say over, but um, I could get closer to what it is by going eight cores and 28 gig of RAM in the D series. Let's look at the A series and see what we have up here uh, two cores, 14, or four cores. Um, so the A series may require a four cores, 28 gig of RAM, and um, it's a little less than um, because we've got less cores than our eight eight cores, 28 gig of RAM. So this is a good choice maybe for this web server. Um, again, you have to come up with these, uh, you know, on your experience, you know, and you can go over or you can go under. You can shoot for the middle. Uh, again, based on utilization, things like that. You want to want to look into that. So we've got our machine there, and uh, we've got one of those machines, again, running all the time. So it's going to give us our total for that web server. And again, we can always modify that. The thing to remember, too, is it's scalable, right? So if we pick a four-core you know, machine in A6 right now, uh, later, if we see that it's not being utilized fully, we could always back that down to uh, something less than what we have, right? So we are going to have to work within the parameters that are provided here. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So when we look at it, we've got our two domain controllers, our web server built, and the next thing we want to build is our database server. So when we look at our table, four CPUs, 32 gig of RAM, 30% utilization. So that's something we want to keep in mind as we're adding this workload. Sorry about 
that. Let's go down here. Again, we're going to pick our regions. In this case, um, if we had software assurance on our SQL Server, we could bring our own licensing. But um, most of our customers, there's quite a few that do have software assurance for SQL Server, but there's plenty that don't, especially on the, the smaller side, which this example covers. So in this case, we're going to pick a, uh, the Windows Server with the SQL Server. And uh, in our case, um, we have different workloads, Enterprise Standard or Web. Uh, for our application, uh, the Standard Edition is going to work fine. And um, in this case, we're going to go ahead and pick the Manage Disk option because um, that's going to give us some some nice uh, flexibility there uh, regarding the storage. And we're going to look at the premium uh, disk. In this case, we're going to pick a P20 because when we go back and look, we need 500 gig of storage for that SQL Server, for that database. So when we look at our, our managed disk options, we have P series and S series. Uh, S series are going to be based on H, you know, regular uh, mechanical HDD drives, and the SSD drives are going to be the premium series. So you know, we want this database to work really well, so we're going to pick the P20 uh, there to give us uh, five, at least 500 gig. And um, we need to modify this for one of those. So when we look at our machine, uh, just to bounce back to even remind myself, four CPUs and 32 gig of RAM, 30% utilized. So in this case, um, again, A or D series, um, I like this 8-core um, a core 28 gig is not a bad option. Uh, again, we you know maybe we don't need that much. Let's look at the A series. There's our four core 28 gig. Uh, let's pick that guy, and you can see it gives us our total. Thing to remember too is this includes all the licensing for the Windows Server and the SQL Server, so that's all built into that cost that comes up in that monthly uh, monthly piece there. So if we look at our roll up piece over here. We've got our domain controllers, our web server, and we want to rename that because it just says virtual machines. We're going to change that to SQL Server. Sorry about that. There we go. So at this point, uh, we've got all our virtual workloads um, created, and we're at 1592.93. Um, if we wanted to add more, if we thought, well, you know, maybe we can scale this down, go with a smaller machine, and have two of them, we could definitely make that choice. And just simply change the number here, and it would, you know, make the associated change for us. Uh, so at this point, I'm happy with, um, you know, the virtual machine um, workload choices that we've got. When we go back over, now we have to think about our storage piece. So if you remember, we covered the SQL Server storage with the managed disk piece, so that 500 gig is out. So we've got right, roughly 1,100 gig that we need in storage. Um, and I will show you. I guess we can do that now. So when we pick these machines, uh, let's add a new workload, and we'll look at virtual machine. And I'll use a D11 because that's what I've created to match it. So when we look at a D11, that's got two cores, 14 gig of RAM, and a 100 gig disk, right? So that disk is only temporary storage, and I'm going to show you that just in a second. Uh, it will seem a lot of seem odd to you if you've not used it, but Microsoft uses it for a swap uh, for everything that's going on. You can definitely use it, but you have to remember if the machine restarts or Microsoft can actually clear the uh, that drive anytime you want. So you don't want to use that drive for your data or your applications. Um, you want to always have additional storage. So that's why I'm not factoring in the storage that comes with the uh, virtual workload. And to show you that real quick, um, we can see this is my um, this is my Azure account. And these are my virtual machines are listed over here, and this is this one I created for this uh, webinar to test. And to show you, it's a D11, like we just saw, two cores, 14 gig of RAM. But if we actually drill into the machine itself, we're going to see that what gets created by default is that C drive. That can grow up to a terabyte, and on that you're going to be uh, charged for what you use uh, when it comes to storage. And then this temporary drive is there, uh, like we talked, as you can see, it's, you know, it's temporary storage. So if I added extra drives, they would show up as E. F or whatever drive letter I want, I can actually rearrange this drive letter to a different letter if I want to, if, D, if I really need a D drive because of my application or something like that. So I just wanted to show you that a lot of folks get confused by that uh, when they're doing the, um, the pricing because they include this storage in that amount, right? So we don't want to do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that machine. And we talked about it um, taking out the. Oops, sorry about that. Back over here. 
taking out the uh, 500 we already got in the managed disk, again, we were left with, left with roughly a terabyte, you know, 1.1 uh, 1 .1 terabyte to, uh, to look at storage cost. So when we hit our add items, we're going to go to our storage section, and we're going to hit storage, and we're going to hit view estimate, and like always, we want to change our region. And then we have some choices here. Uh, depending on what we're going to do, again, there's the manage disk choice that we uh, we picked earlier. Um, all virtual machines, you want to use page, blob, and disk. So in this case, this is all virtual machine storage. If we had other things going on, like uh, we wanted just a, a basic file storage piece that we wanted to maybe use like a, a net use command and map it into servers, that would be a different option. But for these virtual machines that we need this 1.1 terabyte, we're going to go with page, blob, and disk because that's all it's going to let us use uh, when, when you're looking at that. So that's another thing just to keep in mind page, blob, and disk when you're designing storage for, vir for virtual machines, which is what we're doing here, right? So we're going to keep the name storage. If you like to do one of these for every server, again, I've seen people do that, but I do it collectively, right? So there's different storage types, basic and premium. Uh, I know I said standard and premium. It's the same model. I just, you know, they, they use S's in the managed disk. But basically, basic disks, again, are HDD-based and premium are SSD-based. So in this case, um, I think basic storage will work for this environment that I'm working on. If I want to store, uh, local redundant storage stores it um, three times in the uh, in the uh, data center, in this case the East US data center. If I choose global redundant storage, which is a smart choice, uh, most of our customers go that route. It keeps it the same three copies, but it also puts a copy in a, uh, a data center at least 400 miles away. That way if I... Uh, you know, have an outage of the data center for any reason. I still have access to my uh, my data. So in this case, we'll just um, actually we'll keep it at gigabytes and we'll just round it up to 1,200. And uh, or actually we can keep it exactly the same. Sorry. So we had 1.1 terabyte. That's going to be 1,100 gig. And you can see uh, global redundant storage. It's going to you know cost us. Uh, $103.36, it adds that in totals again for us. Uh, storage transactions basically are anything that uh, transaction-based related to storage, so any you know grabbing of information, storing, uh, retrieving, that kind of thing. Uh, you can see one unit is super cheap and it gets us like 10,000 transactions. So a lot of times, um, you know, I've seen customers do different things, but a lot of times we'll put like 100 in here uh, just to have a large number of transactions. And you can see it, um, it's uh, the expense of it. It's relatively uh, minimal, right? Actually, it's super minimal. But anyways, uh, when you look at managed disk, because I chose uh, premium disk um, storage transactions, there's no charge for those, right? So if I'd went to standard, then there could be some extra charges for uh, storage transactions. Again, sorry to bounce around a little bit for you. Just trying to explain what's going on. Uh, so you can see at this point, we've got all our virtual machines, and we've got our storage. And um, we've got our total. So if we look back to our example, the um, you know we've got almost everything covered that we want there. Um, again, I'm doing this a little different than this example shows. I'm not doing the second SQL server, and I'm not doing the second web server. Um, if I wanted to do the second web server, it's not a problem. Um, you know, we could do that um, and do like a scale set uh, in the calculator itself. When you look at the add app item section under the compute workload, it's a scale sets. But it's not going to look any different than what we've already done before. So we could always just um, change our um, our um, our number of web servers as, as we need them. So, so when we look at our diagram, uh, we've got all this infrastructure already priced out. Now we need to look at this uh, VPN gateway that we're going to need uh, to get our clients you know, and also have our on-site domain controller connected into our domain controllers in Azure. And if we did the hybrid environment, we might want to drop one of those domain controllers. It could be redundant. But again, a lot of people like to have two of them, you know, that way. So when we look at the networking section, um, if we need a public IP addresses, we could pick here. In this solution, we don't. Um, I can go back to that in a second, and we can take a look at that part of the calculator. But the thing I'm going to focus on right now is the VPN gateway. So we're going to go ahead and add that and hit view estimate. So uh, our region in this case populates for us. Uh, there's some choices here, basic, standard, high performance, ultra high performance. Uh, most of our customers use the standard VPN. Um, the basic and the standard, basic is static routing, standard does dynamic routing. 
then high performance and ultra high performance is 200 megabits a second uh, for the high level, and then standard VPN have the same speed rate, which is 100 megabits um, per second. Um, again, you really want to check your router and uh, make sure it supports that. Microsoft maintains a list of uh, supported VPN devices, uh, which I can, again, send to you in the document. I have that link in there. But um, they're both fine. Standard's definitely going to cost a little more, but uh, most of the customers have routers that support dynamic um, routing. So when we look at our hours for that gateway, uh, we're going to do 744 like we have for everything else. And um, in this case, we're going to use the VPN connection. Enter a VNet would be in Azure to Azure or from Azure Data Center to another Azure Data Center. So we're going to do VPN. And then this one, you know, uh, we get a lot of questions on outbound. Uh, it, remember, inbound data to Azure is not charged. There's no charge for that. So basically, you have to, you know, start trying to figure out how much outbound um, traffic you're going to have. In this case, we have, you know, uh, web server, SQL server, things like that. So a lot of times, again, this depends. I've seen people put all kinds of different things in here. For this example, I'm going to guess that this is, you know, 500 gig. Uh, even we could take that to um, a terabyte. And you can see it's not crazy pricing-wise. Actually, five terabytes is a little much, but we're going to put in one. So for a terabyte of outbound traffic per month, I'm looking at $88.65. So you'd want to get, you know, what you're comfortable with there. You could use some uh, some network uh, analysis tools, uh, you know, that are out there to uh, come up with that number. But most customers kind of know what that number is going to be. Um, so when you look at it, we've, um, we've rounded out um, our entire solution here. We've got our virtual workloads. We've got our site-to-site our, uh, -site gateway. Our firewall already existed. This stuff existed. Uh, we've got that, you know, this actually shows it going to the side of it, but it actually runs through it like that. Um, that's okay. So we've got our estimate uh, pretty pretty well done, you know, for the, um, for the sample solution that we have here. The next thing that I'm going to roll into, well, actually, I'll show you that public IP address real quick. If we did have a need for public IP address, um, the uh, IP addressing, there's no charge for it in Azure. If you want to have, again, maybe we had a, a terminal server and we wanted to use the web gateway, um, we might need a public IP address. So if we do that and hit our estimate, um, in this case, you always want to work in the ARM portal. The classic is the older portal. Um, most people aren't going to be creating things in there. So we look at the ARM portal. Uh, let's just say, for example, we wanted two public IP addresses and we're going to use them all the time. You can see it's very inexpensive, five dollars and ninety-five cents a month. So, uh, but in our case, we're not using that for our example. I just wanted to show that. So we're going to go ahead and get that guy out of there. Uh, the next thing we want to move into is backup. So, when we look into the storage workload, uh, we notice there's a backup um, option here. So again, the ECS uh, data center. We have to think about how many instances. I'm going to tab back over. So actually, I don't have to tab back over. We can count them right here. We've got one, two domain controllers, web server, three, four. And then we've got our guy that's still on site. So that's going to be five instances. So an instance, basically, if you haven't got that yet, is a uh, an install of an OS, um, you know, Windows Server 2008 R2, 2016, whatever you're running. Um, and then we have to think about the amount of uh, data that we're backing up. In this case, if we go back and look at our example, we've got 1,600 um, gig. We're going to assume that's going to grow a little bit. And we've got our server that's on site also to think about. So we're going to put in two, not two gigabyte, two terabyte. And if we're, well, actually, that's per instance, sorry. So our average instance size, um, let's say 600 terabyte, that number is getting really bad, <laughs> 600 gig for those five instances. So notice uh, that takes us to, to three terabyte, which is a little much. Just we can even get it down. This is what's nice about the calculator. We can kind of play with it to, um, to figure out what we want to do. So there's two and a half. Uh, you can see those five instances are roughly going to cost us $10 per instance a month, just to, that instance charge. We're back to our storage choice, LRS or GRS. Almost everybody, I, I, like I said, I've talked to maybe one person in you know, forever, 
that was doing LRS. Again, nothing wrong with it. It's just going to keep it in that same data center. So most people who want to do backups want to have that extra copy in another data center in case something happens. So we can see to back that up is going to, after the everything's added up there, it's going to be uh, $170 a month to do um, backup of those um, virtual machines and our uh, server that's uh, still on site. And if you didn't need the server on site, we'd change this number to four and we could adjust uh, from there. So you can see there's our, our estimate. estimate. Uh, we're at $2,096.34 a month for that solution. Uh, we can hit export options. Hopefully you guys can see that pretty good. Uh, we can hit export options right here to export that estimate. And we'll go ahead and it'll bring it up in Excel for us. We want to you know, enable the editing of the product and then we'll make it a little bigger here so you guys can see what's going on. And like most things, it creates, you know, it's basically took what we've done and it's broken it out um, into an Excel sheet so that we can provide that uh, to our customer, keep it for ourselves, take the information, modify it, whatever, right? And it even gives us the annual total, which is nice. So that's kind of that part of the solution. Um, hopefully that samples, you know, where it looks good for you, and that's something that kind of makes sense. Again, as small or as large, it's basically the same process, and that's where something like the BitTitan tool, especially as it gets bigger, really shines. Um, you know, we recommend uh, the BitTitan tool all the time. It's, it's a great product. Uh, well, last thing, I guess real quick, we'll take a look at uh, site recovery can be a little tricky. Um, so site recovery in its current form is if uh, you have servers on site, so on premise, and um, you want to um, basically have a DR site in Azure. You can also do site to site if you're, of your own sites. So the product can be an orchestration tool, and that's this option here. Uh, we're not going to get into that today because, to be honest with you, it doesn't come up much at all. And if it does come up, again, I suggest you give us a call, specifically me, and we can kind of talk through those scenarios. Uh, when you look again, it's some basic choices here, East, our region that we've been working in. Um, and again, let's assume maybe that we had those four servers and we didn't want to, you know, go to the cloud right now, but we wanted some site recovery, right? We could hit four of those. And you can see it's $25 an instance. So it's going to cost me roughly, um, when we look at our example, we've been using to keep these machines in a DR site in Azure, not having all the stuff we put together, right? Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is this is assuming that we don't turn them on and it doesn't include the storage, right? So we'd have to do a storage calculation on this because what's happening is it uses our Hyper-V replica technology and it creates plus some other stuff that we bought for some other companies to basically keep a replica of this in Azure and uh, ready to be turned on and rep again re replicating the data all the time. So there is some storage um, there that has to be stored for the machines, and then if you're going to turn them on, um, hopefully you never need to turn them on, but you may want to turn them on to test or whatever, there would be some compute charges for them to be on in Azure, just like we computed these uh, virtual machine workloads. So the site recovery ones are a little bit tricky, and the calculator doesn't cover the entire cost of that. So again, work with us. Uh, you know, I'm familiar with this, and I can definitely help you through these types of um, you know, situations. And um, I guess with that, I don't really have anything else. Um, again, I want to thank you guys all for attending. Uh, this is the slide I was telling you about. Our uh, sales team, 800-237-8931. ATO31 is the main uh, number extension there. And then option one is our uh, is that team. And then I'm my, myself, that's me, John, and um, SEMSFTBO at techdata.com. So, BO is uh, back office, so if you guys have anybody been around doing this as long as I have, uh, this is my 25th year here, uh, 24 is the Microsoft person, uh, if you remember the back office products. Anyways, enough of the uh, nostalgia there, I guess. Uh, that's why that exists in that way. Uh, then there's also Renee. Renee's our architect. He's on the road a lot, so I would definitely use me as the first line of contact. And then uh, Renee's uh, a great guy, too, and uh, he definitely helps out our Azure customers. Um, also, so with that, that's all I have.